Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Our guest this afternoon is a trial lawyer from Houston and a 1984 graduate of the Texas Tech University School of Law. Mark Lanier is a plaintiff's attorney as well as a part-time preacher. He started the Lanier Law Firm in 1990, he began to focus on trial work uh, that included personal injuries, corporate disputes, medical malpractice, dangerous drugs, and asbestos cases. Mr. Lanier and his firm were the first to bring the drug company Merck and Company to trial for the fatal effects of their drug Vioxx and to win a substantial verdict. He is now recognized as one of the top trial lawyers in the United States. In 1998 and 2006, the National Law Journal recognized Mr. Lanier as one of the nation's top 10 trial attorneys. And in 2006, the uh, NLJ designated him as one of the 100 most influential lawyers in America. But his firm continues to have a strong commitment to the best possible representation of all their clients, whether individuals or corporations. Um, and he's dedicated his life to um, his practice, to evening the playing field for all involved. In his own words, fighting large corporations is a bit like professional wrestling meets ballet. The corporations pay for wonderful ballerinas who execute kicks with great precision. We tend to go in as professional wrestlers executing pile drivers. And wrestling beats ballet. Uh, in nonprofit work, Mr. Lanier serves on the board of trustees of the Committee for Economic Development, a nonpartisan organization that addresses ongoing uh, critical economic and social issues facing society. Uh, just earlier this year, the Massachusetts Academy of Trial Attorneys awarded Mr. Lanier with the 2008 Consumer Advocacy Award, noting that his dedication to represent people against a large drug corporation at a time when many felt it was a serious risk for a law firm to assume is nothing short of heroic. It speaks to the passion and belief that Lanier has for the rights of consumers and for their access to justice. So, ladies and gents of Section Cobra, let's give a hand for Mr. Lanier. It's great to be here. I've always wanted to meet folks that weren't able to get into Texas Tech University School of Law. I know Harvard was a safety school for most of you, and I want to applaud you on, on getting here. Uh, it's an honor to be here, uh, uh, to John, to give me this opportunity. I asked John, what do you want me to say? And he said, well, say something that might inspire them. I thought, class is over? No. <laughs> um, no exams? Uh, no. Uh, uh, so uh, he said, uh, say something that might inspire them. So I didn't know what that means. So you know, I tried to find out. I, I did my research behind you. And I thought, you know, boy, they'll be so proud. I've got this Harvard thing. And everybody knows there's only one thing that could ever eat up a Harvard seal. And, and if I could somehow come in here and make this turn on where it works, uh -huh. only one thing that could ever eat up a Harvard seal, and that would be to speak to the COBRA section of Harvard. And so with uh, great appreciation for the fact that I'm here, I had an opportunity Friday to share a four-hour plane ride with two gentlemen whom I love dearly, uh, uh, even though I don't agree with uh, uh, them all the time on everything. But I had an opportunity to talk to Justice Scalia for several uh, uh, hours, and uh, who, by the way, is a Harvard Law graduate, I believe class of 1960, and also Arthur Miller, who was class of 1958. And I told these gentlemen, I'm going to be speaking here today. And I said, I'd love to know what you think I should say. And they said, well, what did the professor say? And I shared with him John's email to me, and Scalia says, huh, that just means tell war stories. And, and Arthur Miller says, yes, tell war stories. So it was with great delight that I get to tell war stories. I mean, this is like, gee, make my day. I didn't have to read any cases. I don't, I mean, I lived them. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you war stories of what's happened through my life. I'm going to try and leave some time for Q&A if, if you all think it's uh, important. But it doesn't bother me if you want to interrupt me as I go along. Um, if you get obnoxious over it, I'll just ignore you. Um, so uh, please feel free to. But I want to tell you a little bit about my life. Um, I actually did my law school. That was them saying tell war stories. I actually did my, my uh, uh, law school at Texas Tech University. And I can remember one of the most useful classes I had when I knew I wanted to do trial law was a criminal procedure class. And the criminal procedure professor we had was actually a lawyer who would come and teach as an adjunct. He was uh, the best criminal defense attorney in Lubbock. Now, I know what you're saying. That's like being the second best ballerina in Providence. It's not that big of a deal. But it actually was. He was a wonderful criminal defense lawyer. And he stood up and he told us, he said, when you get out into the practice of law 
and you actually start picking a jury, one of the things you're going to find is that most lawyers will tell the jury at the very beginning, this is not like TV. This is actually very boring. So don't think that this is going to be like TV. Uh, just know that uh, we'll get through this together. <laughs> and I remember thinking, boy, lawyers would say that. And then he told us, he said, listen, I will go back into the grade book, I will find your record, and I will flunk you if you ever do that in a trial. You have these jurors who've been watching this boob tube, and it's, it's rewired the neurons in their brain in such a way that they think that's what law is. So if you get up there and you try the case like they do on TV, they're going to know you're the real deal. Yeah, that's right. I saw that on Boston Legal. That's the way it's done. <laughs> so I decided then, OK, when I get out, that's what I want to do. So I went. I loved the law. We, 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 uh, my law school experience was wonderful. We, we did moot court. Anybody here do moot court? No? OK. <laughs> Let me tell you what it is. No, um, we did moot court. Um, we, we, we did real well. We won nationals, and, and, and life was great, and I felt real good about it. But the bad part of all of that was moot court is arguing an appeal in a mock way. So I got out of law school, and I took a job at Fulbright and Jaworski. And Fulbright and Jaworski decided I was an appellate lawyer. OK, well, that sucks. Appellate lawyers go to the library, and now maybe they do it with a computer, but they go to the digital library, or the real one, they read through all of these cases, and they write papers. And one great sunshiny morning every six or seven months, they appear in front of an appeals court and argue the law for 20 minutes. Okay, That's not what I wanted to do. That's not what they do on TV. I wanted to do the TV thing. <laughs> so I said, can I please get another job here? And they moved me from appeals, which is a wonderful thing if you are inclined that direction. I applaud you. We all need good law women and good law men in our lives. But I'm a fact guy. Okay? I want to be in the courtroom dealing with the facts. And so I was able to convince them to move me from appeals to torts. Torts. It, any class named after a sweet food is a good class to live by. And I thought, I am so into torts. And I, I want to be a tort lawyer forever. Torts. Man, now I'm at a defense firm, so generally we're defending people. And, and the defense firm found out there was this dreaded plaintiff's lawyer in the Houston area. His name was Ernest Cannon. Fortune magazine had done a write-up about Ernest Cannon because Ernest sued one particular railroad so often in this one county and had taken so much money from them, the railroad made a decision to pull their tracks up out of the county and relay it going around so they couldn't be sued there anymore by Ernest Cannon. And Ernest was phenomenal. Ernest also had a reputation for being incredibly mean in ways you wouldn't necessarily see coming. The knife in the back. And so everyone at Fulbright and Jaworski was scared to death of Ernest Cannon. Now before I went to law school I studied to be a preacher. In fact it was almost a coin flip which to do. Not the TV kind of preacher, though. I think most of them are charlatans. Now, TV lawyers, yes. TV preachers, eh. Um, anyway, and not all of them. I have a friend doing it, so if he ever sees this, not you. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I did stay involved at, at where I went to church. And where I went to church, there were, there's this, uh, in the South more so than, than maybe other places, there's this thing they call Sunday school. And it's kind of, uh, uh, and don't laugh, it's not a bad thing. I'm joking, you laugh. Um, anyway, I taught Sunday school, okay? Ernest Cannon, this mean, fierce lawyer, was in my Sunday school class. And when they found out at Fulbright and Jaworski, they decided to put me on every Ernest Cannon case they had. They figured he was less likely to screw his Sunday school teacher than he was someone else. <laughs> 